Hello, my name is David Bishai. I'll be the instructor in this course, Economics of Health. And this is first session. It's actually session zero because we're mostly going to introduce the content of the course in very broad strokes and then go through the nuts and bolts. So in this short lecture, you're going to hear about the origin of the field of health economics and what makes it special and why you're so lucky to be taking a course in it. Then we'll describe the course, the textbooks, the instructor, the TAs, and your role. I'd like to go back to the origins of the field of health economics. And most of the health economists I know date the origin of our field to a, a seminal paper written in 1963 by Nobel Prize winning economist Kenneth Arrow. The main point of his paper was that health markets are different and health care and health as a commodity is a different sort of commodity, and the three things that make it different are uncertainty, asymmetric information, and externalities. In a later part of the course, we'll be describing how all of these three things operate in health markets and why they make health economics so different. But because health and health care is different, it makes the study of health economics subversive. What I mean is science is most exciting when the paradigms have to shift when the old orthodox ways of explaining the world don't work anymore, new models can arise. So Arrow's problems make the old paradigm dysfunctional, and we have to create new models of what people are doing when they try to become healthy and when they try to sell health commodities. So here are some of the problems that occur because of asymmetric information and uncertainty. First, people's health behavior is irrational, and this subverts the economic assumption that people are rational maximizers of their utility. I don't have to do much to prove to you that health behavior is irrational. We've all been there. We've all known that we should take better care of our health, that we should not eat that second piece of pizza, or that we should go to sleep instead of staying up all night studying. And yet we still make choices that hurt our bodies all the time. How can we explain this? Another area that is problematic is that, according to economics, even our politicians are rational maximizers, and they are always trying to enact policies that help us improve our social welfare. And yet in health economics, economists point out political changes, policy changes that make us all better, and the political systems cannot do them. In 2017, we saw this as Congress failed to pass any reforms to the Affordable Care Act, even though the current system had serious flaws uh, that were recognized by both the left and the right. Finally, a subversive area is that what makes us healthy is actually not closely related to the commodities that we buy from hospitals and doctors. What stops you from being sick is something that you won't find in a pharmacy or a hospital mostly. It's a good lifestyle where you don't smoke and drink and you take care of your body. Uh, so our model of supply and demand of health commodities is also something that is being questioned. So you will become a better economist by taking your understanding of economics to the limits and then beyond the limits to areas that are really part of where the future of research will be. What's very exciting to me is that health economics requires systems thinking and the systems are much more complex than the, the old model of Adam Smith that, where there was a shoemaker who had to sell the shoes and the consumer would buy the shoes. That was a pretty complex system. But in health, we have separate systems in order to take care of the financing of health care, systems to make the quality of the drugs and doctors adequate. We have separate supply chains to move the drugs and supplies and workers around. There's a system of innovation, a system to create the workers in the workforce, and a system to make the households show up and use the products appropriately to, to become healthy. So health economics is also very applied. Other economists ask mundane questions like, should I buy stocks or bonds? How can the Fed lower inflation? How can Toyota sell more cars? But in health economics, we're talking about life and death. What human choices will save the most lives of the most disadvantaged? I can't think of a better question to spend my time trying to answer. And now you get to do that too. So going back to this assumption that there's actually something people can do about the health of populations, I want to point out that that's a new idea. That idea wasn't the way most of, of our human ancestors lived. Here is a picture of the participants in 
Boccaccio's Decameron at the first chapter, where they are sitting in their villa, worried about the plague that is ravaging the townspeople below. And they thought there was nothing they could do. They were all going to die. And the quote from Boccaccio says, It was as though they imagined that the wrath of God would not unleash this plague against men for their iniquities, irrespective of where they happened to be. So in the next subsequent chapters of the book, Boccaccio describes how they just sat around telling stories because they felt that there was absolutely nothing to do to avoid getting plague. None of you would, would approach plague that way. You would run for a vaccine, you would go and stock up on penicillin, uh, and you would cover your mouth and nose. There's plenty to do to control plague epidemics, and we're doing it all the time. That exciting era that we live in, where there's something we can do to make whole populations get healthier, makes studying health economics a very timely thing to do. I'd like to also point out that health economics takes us beyond the delusions of bench scientists. Many uh, students come to college wanting to make the world a better place, and they get seduced by the lore of the bench and the scientific discovery. This is a picture of, of a character called Aerosmith, and he's in his lab thinking about how he can make the world better. And probably what's in his head is, if only I could find a cure. Well, here's the problem. We have wonderful cures that are already invented, and the reason people are still dying is that the markets aren't working. Take an example of measles vaccine. It was invented in 1963, currently costs 21 cents a dose, and still today 200,000 children are dying every year of measles. We don't need Aerosmith to invent a new vaccine. We need to give this 21 cent vaccine to every child in the world. That's where markets and understanding of complex systems comes in. And by becoming a health economist, you can move cures to the people and really show that uh, we can make progress with what we have. What a waste for Aerosmith to invent one more new molecule that sits on the shelf for another 50 years. You can stop that tragedy from happening by studying health economics. We are living in a split society where people have very important political views to share about this, the nature of health economics. And as your professor, I have to be careful to really focus on what the science says and what the models have t told us. So I will try to show both sides of the arguments. I am not here to teach you what to think. I really want you to be able to use the models and then apply those models to your core values and your understanding of how human society functions. So I hope you to reach your own conclusions and I will try to shrink into the background when it comes to saying that the left or the right has the, the right approach to healthcare reform. But I want to tell you that, that it's very clear that we won't always agree on every policy. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts. We have a textbook, uh, Rice and Unruh, and Rice and Unruh are liberals. They see an expansive role for government in the health sector. They are not a knee-jerk liberal on this. They are very careful to offer an argument on why the government's intrusion into the health sector will make us all better off. And we can look at the assumptions that they're making and evaluate whether we are persuaded. Now, during some of the exercises, I'm having you read excerpts from a book by Tate. And Tate is a conservative. He is profoundly skeptical of the government role. And Tate is there to help us with our homework, to see other perspectives, you won't need to memorize the, the readings from Tate or passing tests, but I wanted to give at least some readings that come from a more conservative uh, right-wing author. Let me tell you about myself. I uh, went to college at Harvard where I measured in, majored in philosophy and physics. I was not an economics major. I really decided to become a health economist during my senior year of college, and at that point, it was really too late for me. I took the intro to economics as a senior and then throughout medical school kept on taking economics classes and during my medical residency started to take more economics classes. Finally, after I finished my residency in medicine and pediatrics, I applied for the PhD in health economics at the Wharton Business School where I was very fortunate. 
Let me tell you what happened in my senior year that made me become a health economist. I was sitting in a biology class taught by E.O. Wilson, and he showed this slide of the planetary growth of population. You can see how sometime around 600 years ago, the population of the planet began to accelerate. When I saw this graph, I said to myself, that's an important issue. This was the, the global warming of, of 1982. Uh, we were reading books about the population bomb and how we're going back into Malthusian winter. And when I saw this, I said, that is going to be a, a problem that combines two things, health technology to uh, develop better contraceptive technology, but more than that, the distribution of contraceptive technology. And I decided right there in 1982 that I wanted to get two degrees. I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to be an economist. And that's what I did. I pursued that dream and here I am as a health economist. Let me tell you about some of my teachers. When I was at Harvard, I got to study with Professor John Rawls in philosophy and we'll be touching on some of how Rawls's philosophy affects health economics. I also studied with Professor Mark Pauly and Patricia Danzen at the Wharton Business School, and we'll also be reading some of their uh, uh, thoughts on healthcare reform. Let me tell you a little bit about my research. I uh, do a lot of work on household health decision making. I study how parents and grandparents affect the health of children. I study the special role of father involvement and how changes in marriage markets affect the presence of fathers in their children's lives. And I test models of adolescent uh, risk-taking behavior. Uh, on a more macro scale, I like to study the health departments of the world. And so you will learn what a public health department is and does and its role in making us all healthier. When I study public health, I often look at how public health departments help us uh, spread vaccines, um, micronutrients, fortified food, how health departments help us become safer on our roads and in our homes, and how health departments help improve the quality of medical care. So you'll be seeing some of my research come in uh, as we go through the course. Now about the course, the course covers the basic elements of supply and demand in the health sector to help make you a, a good health economist. We're going to cover models. There'll be models that appear in our, the textbook, we'll discuss them in the class, and then we'll discuss them in group discussion. And in the syllabus, we'll go through how that all plays out. What's your role? You really have to take notes in this class. The lectures are fundamental. If you miss out on a lecture, go get the notes from a friend and make sure you understand the models that come up in lecture. You need to be able to understand every model. I'd like you to keep up with the readings. I will call on you in class to talk about the readings. I want you to ask questions when things aren't clear. I don't want cell phones to ring. Uh, using electronic devices, laptops and tablets is important so you can follow in on the lectures. Please don't miss the midterm or the final. And your assignments are due on the due date. If you have an unexcused late assignment, we subtract 10 points per day. But you can ask for an excuse for a health or family problem and with a note. So I look forward to seeing you in class and having a great time this quarter as we go through health economics.